Hi, welcome to uh, uh, our, our wonderful session. We're going to talk, uh, we've got our great partners here from Palo Alto Networks. My name is uh, Jim Caggy. I manage the DoD Solutions team for Amazon Web Services. Uh, I've been doing uh, DoD Solutions architecture for about four years, uh, working with, great, again, great partners, uh, Palo Alto Networks, and working with our customers in the federal space in both national security and DoD for a number of years. And to kind of kick off the session, I'm going to give a quick overview on some of the latest developments uh, 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 that Amazon's had in the DoD space. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the accreditations and some of their latest cloud policy. And then we'll roll into how Palo Alto Networks is helping to facilitate getting DoD customers into AWS and running their environments uh, securely and uh, in an accredited manner. Uh, and, and uh, in accordance with the DoD Cloud SRG and Secure Cloud Computing uh, uh, Architecture uh, Policy. So let's kind of dive right into it. Um, just kind of a quick update, as you might have heard from the, if you went to the keynote this morning or, you know, if you went to some of our other sessions earlier today, like the one before this, um, you know, AWS has achieved FedRAMP high. Uh, from a DoD accreditation standpoint, if you're familiar with the DoD Cloud Security Requirements Guide, we've got a, a provisional ATO for Impact Level 4. Uh, Impact Level 5 is expected soon, so uh, that's going to happen really, really quickly here. We're really excited about that. That essentially, if you're not familiar with the DoD impact levels, uh, Impact Level 5 is the DoD's highest uh, data classification for unclassified data. Uh, it generally means that the data in the system is an uh, unclassified national security system. So uh, we're really, really excited for Impact Level 5. Um, and then also in, the, in both the federal and DoD spaces, uh, we've done uh, quite a bit uh, of work to uh, uh, get Amazon regions and Amazon networks connected to DoD information networks, uh, such as NipperNet or DREN. Uh, we've actually been connected to, uh, when we say DODEN, for those, again, not familiar with DoD acronyms, the DODEN is a DoD information network. Um, and in this, in this context, we're talking about unclassified networks. So we've been really fortunate to be connected to the Doden uh, DoD networks in both the East Coast and West Coast using Amazon Direct Connect. Um, and we've been uh, connecting individual DoD mission owners up uh, to uh, the NipperNet from AWS since 2014. So quick update on, on DoD cloud policy. And, you know, I, we focused a little bit in this intro on DoD because uh, we're seeing a lot of customers uh, throughout the public sector uh, kind of look towards U.S. federal cloud policy as, as sort of the gold standard for the security controls and implementations that they should put in place uh, for their most sensitive wor workloads and data. You know, when, when the U.S. government came out with FedRAMP back in 2013, it was quickly copied and modeled by uh, state and local governments throughout the United States. It was copied by uh, many, uh, uh, many nations around the world. Uh, they might all call it something a little bit different, but in general what it really is is you have these uh, security controls uh, defined by NIST, and, and uh, these security controls, if implemented in a certain way, provides assurances that your data and your workload is secure. In the DoD world, they have their version of um, implementing uh, FedRAMP is called the Cloud Security Requirements Guide. Um, and again, a lot, of, a lot of agencies, whether they're military agencies or military departments around the world or, or even in some cases uh, educational or private, inst or private institutions or commercial entities have actually kind of looked at the DOD cloud requirements and who the DOD is accrediting as kind of you know, a high watermark for assurance that a cloud provider or a cloud services are secure enough to hold, host their most sensitive workload. So uh, real quick, uh, the SRG has been out for a few years, but just recently, back in March, uh, DOD released the Secure Cloud Computing Architecture. And what I like about it is um, it provides implementation flexibility and the freedom to architect and manage your uh, manage shared services and security services um, in, a, in a way that makes sense for your, your particular application. So I'll just kind of give you a quick overview of what this is and then how Palo Alto Networks plays into this. Um, so in the DoD world, they have a concept of a virtual data center security stack. The idea is that if you're going to move, you know, a dozen or a hundred uh, uh, individual web applications or some other type of application into the cloud, um, you, in, in many cases, you can share some of your security services. You might be able to share your uh, intrusion prevention system. You might be able to share web access firewall capabilities. You know, there's no reason to deploy uh, an IPS per application or a WAF per application in some cases if they're 
if the uh, if the applications are similar enough, and um, you know, ver variety of security and, and uh, scalability factors in place. There, but a lot of it has to do with actually just just saving cost and a little bit more flexibility and scaling. So. In the, in the DoD, they've defined this virtual data center security stack as a play, it's, a, it's an enclave, or in the AWS world, it would be like a VPC where you deploy your security uh, tools. And then they also define a virtual data center management stack. And really what this is is a place where you might put your shared services like DNS, Active Directory, patching services, um, NTP services, et cetera. Um, in the DoD, they have something that's called a cybersecurity service provider. It's kind of like the uh, security operations center in the DoD or folks that do incident reporting, incident handling. CSSPs um, in the DoD cybersecurity service providers might put some tools in the VDMS as well. One other interesting thing they, they realize in the DoD is that, you know, very often most of the common attack vectors um, that affect cloud environments um, are not just network-based now. A lot of it has to do, a lot of uh, cloud environments are, are, uh, are only as secure as the uh, privileged user credentials that, you, that you've issued out to manage those environments. So privileged user access control and management, separation of duties becomes really, really critical in the cloud. I mean, it's always critical no matter where you're deployed, but especially in AWS, you know, we provide identity and access management services. It's really important to employ um, uh, th those services correctly in the least privileged model. So in the DOD, they created this concept, this concept of what's called a trusted cloud credential manager. And really what it is is a policy where a risk, a risk authorizing official uh, sets a policy for that organization and how they should manage their privileged user credentials. So th very common sense best practices like use multi-factor authentication, use a complex password, only grant access to certain pr uh, privileged user actions to people that are in that role. For example, um, if someone has access to build your VPCs and create peering connections to private networks, you know, maybe that same person shouldn't have access to certain ACL or security group features or however you want to separate those duties in a way that, you know, very sensitive operations are audited or maybe you even require a quorum or some type of approval. And so the TCCM, it, it, could, be, it could be enforced technically. Of course, in AWS, we have CloudTrail, AWS Config, uh, Identity and Access Management. You can use those features and tools to enforce a policy, but generally what it is is a, is a policy and a governance model for the kind of the rough, left and right limits for managing cloud credentials. And then in the DOD, they have this idea of what's called a cloud access point. This is really just a security boundary gateway uh, service to secure connectivity between um, an Amazon virtual private cloud and, uh, and, and a DOD network. Um, in, in the federal civilian government arena in the U.S., they have kind of a similar construct. Uh, there's secure connectivity requirements, and for, of course, they also have uh, something that's called the Trusted Internet Connection Program. So the cap is kind of similar in the type of requirements there. All right, so uh, diving into, so let me, you know, a specific DoD implementation of these, of these things are, you know, VDSS, place for your WAF. It's like a VPC for your WAF, your IPS. Maybe you put a firewall, a full pack of capture devices, NetFlow logs, all that stuff. VDMS is a place where you put your host-based security services. If you're using like a tenable Nessus scanner to do scans, endpoint vulnerability scanning, you might put your like uh, your security center inside of uh, the VDMS, et cetera. So if you're using a Palo Alto Networks firewall, and uh, George will talk about this in a little bit, you put that, you, uh, one of the places you can put that in is the VDSS stack. And so what we've actually done in AWS is um, we've architected this out for several customers. Um, what you have here is three VPCs. You've got, on the right, you've got uh, what we call a mission owner, which could be a web application, kind of your standard three-tier web application scaled across multiple availability zones. And then you got your VDMS VPC, and then you got your v uh, VDSS uh, VPC. And of course, if you're in the DoD world, you might connect that environment through AWS Direct Connect uh, back into uh, a DoD network. If you're, you know, in a, uh, if you're not in the DoD or if you're, you know, if, uh, an educational institute, um, uh, you know, you might just be tying this back to your to some private network or to an existing data center that you might have out there, or even out to the internet. You might you might actually just connect this entire environment right up to the internet if you're not in the DoD. And so, um, what's really great about working with Palo Alto Networks is uh, we we actually um, in in, in AWS.Amazon.com quick starts. Um, we have a number of cloud formation templates and templates and security controls uh, documentation that actually shows you how to implement NIST uh, security controls and FedRAMP security controls inside of the cloud. And we actually give you the cloud formation templates to 
um, to implement those security controls in an automated way. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview of something we're working on. I'll talk a little bit more in detail about this at a session on SECA tomorrow if you're DOD focused or interested in what the DOD is doing. We actually, everything you're looking here in this diagram, we've actually automated this, the deployment of all, all three of these VPCs and these services, we've automated that. And we've actually written a deployment guide and we've actually uh, listed out all the NIST 853 security controls that this architecture implements to create a DOD compliant impact level four, impact level five environment. And what's really great working with Palo Alto Networks is uh, they provided us uh, their next generation firewall capabilities to deploy in the virtual data center security stack to provide, um, to pr to provide uh, uh, firewall capabilities and, and uh, other uh, web access firewall type capabilities. So um, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to George to talk about uh, what, what Palo Alto Networks' uh, next generation firewall capabilities are, what, what the value it's bringing to not just the DOD, but really the entire uh, AWS public sector community. So George, really happy to have you here. Cool. Yep. Thank you, Jim. Jim, it's always a pleasure to present with you, and I appreciate the opportunity to be before all of you today. Just by a quick show of hands, do we have any uh, current Palo Alto Networks customers in the crowd? I see a few familiar faces. We thank you for, for placing your trust in us. Our mission, plainly stated, is to protect our way of life in the digital age by preventing successful cyber attacks. And what I really, really desperately want everybody in this room to understand by the time that I'm done presenting to you is really what sets our next generation firewall security capabilities apart from maybe what you've been accustomed to by uh, years of exposure to legacy security products, uh, et cetera. So we're gonna do a little bit of level setting here and we're gonna go back to the very first day you sat in your cube or, or in your office as a security practitioner. And uh, first day on the job, boss comes in, hey, thanks, it's great to have you here. We're, we're looking forward to, to getting some help from you on the security side. Uh, first thing I have for you is a super mission critical task wherein we need you to protect this environment from that, from one of those, whatever that is, that is that, that's it, that's the threat that must not enter this environment, this building, this network, this cube, whatever, whatever you're in charge of protecting, whatever your mission is. And uh, there's no, no pressure, no pressure at all. If, uh, if you should fail, uh, we're looking at massive loss of maybe PII for our employees, those we support in mission, maybe even uh, source code. We'll wind up on the front page of the New York Times above the fold for all the wrong reasons. You'll probably have to start another career. Everything's fine. There it is. Stop it. A couple things are going through your mind right now. I knew I should have taken that other job instead. Second thing in no particular order maybe is, well, uh, what is that? I, I think I saw that in the bottom of my fish tank when I was in seventh grade when I had two goldfish. Um, that looks like it could be like a Star Trek alien from Deep Space Nine. Any Deep Space Nine fans in the house? Um, third thing you might be thinking is, that guy's crazy. Fourth thing, how about this? This isn't fair. What is that? I don't know what that is. I mean, who does that? Who asks you to perform a security critical function that's very high stakes, with some very serious consequences should you fail, it gives you part of the picture to do it. I mean, wouldn't it have been easier if I just showed you the whole picture? You know, hey, find the guy from the Budweiser commercial from the 90s, I'm gonna date myself a little bit here. Uh, keep him out of here, regardless of uh, what color he's wearing. So, there is a, a, a very big difference between seeing part of the picture and seeing the whole picture. We give you the x-ray vision goggles to see the whole picture and to secure the entire picture. But I mean, who would, who would do it the other way? I mean, who does that? Uh, apparently a lot of us. What you're looking at right now is a three tuple. That is a source IP address, a destination IP address, and a, and a port number. And that is very basic 101 connectivity information about a session. And there's a lot more to what's going on in this particular session than meets the eye. Now, as a security practitioner of decades gone by, you may be used to seeing these as the only security controls that you have had to enable traffic to traverse your firewall or your proxy or what have you. But um, this isn't the good old days. We don't need to open three ports on a firewall and assume that all the applications are gonna play by their rules. Let's play this like a game show. I, I think, I, I like game shows. So uh, let's, let's check door number one. We're rolling the dice, okay? We've got a three tuple, that's what we're allowing. Oh look, we have an application in play, some GeoIP information. We've got a user, the user's a member of a group. Ooh, we're dealing with encryption. 
We have an application in play. This is all real stuff that happens all the time on your networks and your missions. We have a function of an application. And we actually have data within the application and a file type. So this is door number one. Congratulations, you've rolled the dice. And it looks like we may actually have a privileged user who's in like a PD role, uh, business development role or a product management role who is sharing some information that's proprietary and confidential over the WAN encrypted. Perhaps it's with a, a partner or a remote enclave, something to that effect. Good job, we did great. Even though we didn't really earn it, we did great, we passed. Um, we offer you security controls that allow you to make match criteria within your security policy as granular as all the stuff that you see up here. Let's roll the dice again. Let's check out door number two. Door number two didn't look so good. We didn't do so good this time when we rolled the dice. You could actually be looking at a session here that could have very similar or the same three tuple information where you could literally be, experience a, be experiencing a malware dropper that's installing malware and perhaps instigating a callback to a command and control server on a hostile nation state network. We call that getting pwned. So door number two, we wanna stay out of. What has the legacy security industry's response been to this? It's been to sell you stuff. Sell you a point product for this, a point product for that, a point product for the other, because nobody really bothered to reinvent the firewall to see what it really needs to see and decode and stop in terms of threats both known and unknown, to really protect your data and your mission. So here's what you got in exchange for your troubles. We went out and we spent a lot of money, and we got a, a point product for protecting mail, for filtering web. Uh, we've got an IPS IDS, this is fantastic. But for decades, uh, we've, we've seen a, a rise in frequency and intensity and embarrassment level for high-level data pro, uh, breaches and data exfiltration. So what, do you, what, what did you get for your trouble? Well. We've got a bunch of things that all now have limited visibility within your environment, and you really, you can't secure what you can't see. We, uh, we also have a lack of correlation, a lack of cooperation between these technologies. They don't, none of them can speak to each other well enough to really give you a cohesive picture of exactly what's happening in a particular session with, with all those given match criteria that we were talking about behind door number one and door number two. And not to mention, uh, you're gonna have different UIs for this, different logging repositories, maybe you've got to play around with a SIM now, and uh, if the technologies don't play together, goodness gracious, there's no guarantee that the people will even, and that's, that's a, an increase in, in care and feeding count and, and body count to nurse these disparate technologies or point products. And the last thing, this is my favorite one, this is manual response. Now remember, we bought all this stuff to solve a problem, and at the end of the day, what's gonna happen? Alert fatigue, alert, 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 we have log entries. Oh my God, something bad may have happened. Um, have you got half a day to, to go back and, 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 and take a look at that? Because you know, we, don't, we don't really know what happened. So let's just, let's just back up and, and review the insanity of this. We are now manually remediating a potential patient zero scenario in our environment because all the stuff that we bought kind of just went like this, set off a bunch of lights and alarms and just said, you know, uh, you go fix it. And studies have shown that it takes between two and five hours to manually triage patient zero in such a, an instance. And I'm telling you what, if I'm your, if I'm your adversary, if, if, I'm the, if I'm the hostile, if I'm the attacker, man, I'll take that every day. I'm gonna set another one of those off. Maybe I can get another guy to, 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 to look away from the left hand while the right hand moves laterally within your network. That's not, we're not in the detect and remediate game. We don't, we don't do alert fatigue. Our, our model is really, truly, prevention, as, as I previously stated, and a, a real platform approach. Let's give you all the visibility and all the tools that you need to see everything you need to see, to write the granular policies that you need to safely enable applications and prevent known attacks and turn unknown potential attacks into known threats incredibly quickly by leveraging our wildfire cloud. So these are the kind of the four tenets of delivering on our promise of prevention. Complete visibility, that's what we've been drilling uh, all, all presentations so far. That is namely seeing all applications on all ports all the time, being able to decode them, being able to read the data within the files that are in these sessions that are used by applications, what functions in the applications are being used, who's the user who's using it, what, uh, what's the IP address of their endpoint, let's associate those. So we, we, get, we get all this visibility, we can see, we can see threats, we can filter on uh, dirty words, classification levels, program, program names, even if something isn't malware to, to kind of keep what we want where we want it. But we could maybe let the backup 
process, take any file at once and send it anywhere it needs to across the firewall. But there's no reason that, uh, that a shoe clerk needs to be sending source code across the firewall. But this is the granularity and the visibility we're talking about. So take advantage of that and reduce your attack surface. Safely enable applications as granularly as you need to or care to. Um, a smaller attack surface is as effective uh, a prevention, it is very effective, it is, it's, it's very impossible to understate the importance of uh, using that scalpel to open access in your network or your environment instead of the sledgehammer. And preventing known threats, that's something that we do for you in line in a single pass. We scan for, we can scan for viruses, uh, exploits, IPS, IDS, web filtering, uh, scan for spyware, and um, even unknown threats like we talked about, all in a single pass. And last but certainly not least is preventing unknown threats, and that's namely our wildfire cloud. It has one job and one job alone, and that is to take a file that, it has, that your firewall has seen and it's not sure if it's malware or not, send it up to wild, the wildfire cloud for analysis, which is incredibly powerful and is capable of analyzing these files in li uh, literally a matter of minutes in both static and dynamic manners to include machine learning, bare metal detonation for malware that may be sandbox aware, sandbox detonation, uh, model file analysis, et cetera. So turning unknowns into knowns very quickly, wildfire can actually analyze something within a couple minutes and deliver an inoculation not only to the firewall that submitted it, but to every firewall that has a wildfire subscription with Palo Alto Networks around the world. Now, that, that sounds cute, but that's actually incredibly powerful. We're talking about over 35,000 firewalls around the world and over one million of our traps endpoints that are standing in line to be patient zero for you. And you, heaven forbid, if you befall that fate, you can be patient zero for them. Uh, something that does come to mind that we get asked about a lot lately is WannaCry. We actually had same morning coverage uh, with, well within an hour for the first time we saw an outbreak of WannaCry, thanks to the wildfire cloud. So taking these tenants and considering them as not cute icons on the private slide, but real capabilities that we have to deliver on to empower you to, to, to have this superior secure, security posture, you'll see that there's a lot of things that you have to do and you have to do well. And they, these things have to talk to each other. And it's, it's not easy. <laughs> these requirements change because the adversaries are changing their tactics. New technologies emerge. You know, the rise of SaaS, I mean, Amazon Web Services, clearly a huge player and a, and a game changer in the way that, that we deliver and consume technology. So you know, if we're going to uh, prevent just known threats, we better be able to see it on all applications. If we're gonna block malicious URLs, you betcha, we'd better be able to, to peek into encrypted traffic, which we can. So if we wanna maybe counter that argument that some might say, no, no, I, 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 still, I still need my Wubi, I still want my, my point products, my, 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 my this and that for this and that alone function. Upon examination, that's gonna kind of fall apart a little bit. Let's just say that we're all gonna start a startup. Like, I know we're tired, it's been a long day, but at seven o'clock, meet me out in the hallway here, we'll, st we'll, make a, we'll start our own startup, and we're going to prevent nothing but known malware. And if we're going to truly be effective at preventing all known malware, you're going to see these interdependencies, the ability to have to see and decode all applications on all ports. You're gonna need to do that if you're gonna need to stop malware. You gotta be able to break encryption. You gotta be able to do that in the cloud. You betcha you better be able to do that. Otherwise, you'd stink at preventing known malware. So singing from one sheet of music in one column alone to try to do this, it, it's, it's not gonna cut the mustard. The, the, the need is already crying out for a platform-based approach which we deliver you. And speak nothing to even if you mastered just blocking known malware, what are you gonna do when you come up against unknown malware? <laughs> You'll be out of luck. So keeping in mind all the differentiators that we're talking about and that granularity and the, these capabilities, they're available for you to consume in Amazon Web Services and uh, certainly in GovCloud for your, for your missions here. Uh, the next generation firewall, in addition to being you know, game-changing hardware that we put on the market about uh, nine, 10 years ago, is available as an Amazon machine image in AMI uh, in virtual form factor that is fully functional. So when we talk about like a single pass architecture, you know, properly provisioned AMIs with multiple cores are able to mimic a single pass through the firewall for all kinds of scanning, for networking, for threat detection, and for policy lookup on the spot. Um, and we can 
be used to secure inter-VPC traffic. Uh, we can even integrate with like a load balancing solution, et cetera. So safe applic application enablement and threat prevention becomes a reality in AWS. Now, going forward, we're, we're, I'm, I'm gonna kinda steer the ship here and, and come full circle and, and come back to what Jim was talking about with the, with the SCCA stuff. So we have a capability that allows you to automatically deploy fully configured firewalls. We call that feature bootstrapping. And that feature is available on physical hardware. It's also available in the VM series. In this case, for the sake of our context, our discussion, we're gonna take an S3 bucket, which will be the, uh, the repository we're gonna leverage. And we create a, a predetermined file structure within there. And we put some pretty specific files, uh, configuration for the firewall, licenses, um, depending on if you're in a marketplace or bring your own license model and um, software updates, dynamic content. These are actual updates to the operating system of the firewall, or when we say dynamic content, or, or for short, we'll just call it content. Content can be new application definitions, new threat definitions that we saw, et cetera. You throw those in your S3 bucket, and the firewall will assimilate those when it comes to life as well. And if you happen to be an existing customer or you're interested, um, Panorama, if you have that on, uh, on, on premise or in your own enclave, that is our central management solution that allows you to manage thousands upon thousands of firewalls from a single interface uh, very, very granularly by using templates and chunks of templates, kind of like uh, when you go to Subway. You don't just ask for a, a, you know, a, a, a BMT. You tell them everything you want on it. You build your templates the same way. And you can take pieces of these templates and we do this act we call template stacking. You can say, hey, this group of firewalls needs this configuration element. So does this one. Uh, this group over here needs this as well. So you can very modularly build and deploy your firewall configs. But a lot of, a lot of folks, um, we see a lot of folks in federal bring their own orchestration tools and leverage our XML API, which we talked about a little bit earlier in our DevOps talk to orchestrate things. So Panorama, is awesome, it's optional, it's, it's absolutely uh, not mandatory for, for bringing this all to life. So what we can wind up doing is incorporating this in the VPC and uh, unleash some real power when you can include it in a CFT or a, like a, a, an elastic load balancing type of situation. We actually uh, were one of the, if not the first vendor to support natively ELB and ALB and AWS. So uh, very, very cool stuff. Just a, a quicker look here at uh, kind of the backbone of uh, this uh, CFT incorporated SCCA stuff here. So we can leverage elastic load balancing and auto scaling, like I said, with some, some native tools within AWS, within, within uh, GovCloud as well, to allow your security tier or tiers to scale in and out as needed um, using the, some of the mechanisms that we've already talked about. And this is, uh, this is Incredibly cool, and it's incredibly powerful. It's, it's actually uh, almost downright fun to play with. Now, you may not be a fan of auto-scaling. You, you may not be a retailer who needs this much firewall 363 days of the year, and then on Black Friday and Cyber Monday, you need this much firewall. Maybe you build at scale. That's cool, too. Uh, if you're building at scale, we have the right size hammer for you. We have VM series firewalls that are available that have up to eight gigs of app ID or four gigs threat protected throughput, and uh, even some of the legacy stuff, which is uh, you know, r around a gig or two of throughput, um, s allowing you to maybe build at scale if you like. So uh, plenty of options, plenty of power to be had in the VM series. And if you roll all of this up, we're in a really, really great position. When uh, what, what Jim was referring to is the SCCA quick start, we will have a Palo Alto Networks firewall that uh, our team, in conjunction with the, the folks at Amazon, have extensively worked to build in as many of these NIST security controls as we possibly could in a template and document them. So uh, if there's any football fans in the house, l allow me to use a gratuitous sports analogy here. We're not gonna carry, we can't carry you across the goal line, but we can sure as heck get you inside the red zone. Uh, there are certain things that are just going to be unique to your environment that we just can't know and we just can't put in a template. There may be a, there's going to be a placeholder for, say, your, your syslog server's IP address, placeholder uh, perhaps for your uh, radius server and, and the like. But the uh, point being is once you have the SCCA in place, you're able to deploy very quickly 
You'd be very close to attaining your ATO in terms of having controls in place, documented in an Excel spreadsheet that I personally have spent a lot of time working on, um, enumerating which controls are applicable to the Palo Alto Network's firewall, whether they are implemented in, uh, in, in many, many cases, uh, imparting additional guidance regarding those controls. Let's, let's just, for example, take like a denial of service uh, attacks, or mitigation from those, or flood attacks. Yeah, th that is definitely a season to taste type of setting. Um, you can turn on uh, DOS protection with default values, and really depending upon the size of your operation or your enclave, they might be, they might be an ideal setting for you to, to stop those attacks, or you, you might DOS yourself right out of the box if you've got a huge enclave. So all those things are kind of covered there. But given the power of the platform in AWS and GovCloud, the beauty of this is you can deploy this once, you can get your config just right, and you can extract that from the firewall and make that your new bootstrap and then incorporate that into, into your CFT so you can get a make it once, deploy it many times, kind of a rinse and repeat sort of scenario. And it's very cool stuff and um, it is, it's been a lot of work on, on both the Palo Alto network side and I'm, I'm certain on the Amazon side. So uh, this, this package is fairly eminent. I think it's fair to say I don't have an exact date. Uh, Jim and I were just talking about this. I'd say that um, you know, if this was a concept car, we've, we're probably just about ready to reach for the armor all and get the last couple fingerprints off the paint before we roll it out. But um, you know, I'm certainly available after the session if you want to exchange contact info and follow up on uh, more information about that just to, to stay informed. And um, we have 20-ish minutes left. I'd like to tell you a story. I come from a family of storytellers, and in this case, we're gonna tell you the story of a naughty user and how the next generation firewall help us figure them out pretty quickly. Um, what you're looking at right now is the graphic user interface of our next generation firewall. This is actually a single instance of the VM300 model, which is running on AWS. This is completely web-driven. This, I can't say this, I can't emphasize this enough. This isn't hard to do. I made my living for over a decade on a CLI of a competitor's product. And when I started working for Palo Alto Networks, the day before I, st the day I started, I got my, my personal firewall FedEx that morning, and I was told I had to have it configured as such within two weeks before I went to boot camp. I initially was terrified, and I can honestly tell you that within 48 hours, I was like, this, is, this isn't hard. It doesn't have to be hard to be effective. So this is, this is the dashboard. This is just some fingers and toes information. And by the way, quick round of applause. There is absolutely no Java in play here. Uh, basic information about the firewall. Sorry, I had to, had to put a spear in Java. Um, we might look at the dashboard and go, man, I want to tweak this. I need to see the status of my interfaces. Yeah, but not there. I would like my interfaces there. The UI will remember that the next time you log on. Maybe you don't want to see your interfaces. So uh, this is some log snippets, some fingers and toes information. But this is the application command center, what we call the ACC. And this is the visibility that you've always wanted, that you deserve, that you needed in your firewall. And we're, we've kind of got a 10,000 foot overview and we have familiar information in here in, in the forms of source and destination IP address activity in some of these widgets. But we also, right off the crack of the bat, we're making good on our promise of giving you that visibility. These are real applications in use. And we're gonna come back to the application usage widget here in a second. And um, coming right down just beside it, just to the right here, this is user activity. These are real users who use this uh, test environment for us and, and it's reporting on their activity. Again, some uh, layer three type information, source and destination IP address. And uh, all these things, by the way, they're interactive. If I can figure out how to use this laptop, I can zoom in on that. And you notice how just this one widget will repaint um, and allow us to zoom in on a specific uh, piece, of, piece of data there. And come on down here a little bit. We've got uh, geolocation information mapped out there, again, as pertaining to this session activity. And at the bottom, right there in front of you, is rule usage. These are your, your top rule hits. And in this case, we're actually over here on the filter bar. Take a quick look. We're just looking at the last hour. 
that's customizable. We've got various drop-down options. You can even set it custom. Um, so we're going we're to kind of dig in to the application usage widget here. Um, this is uh, kind of a, a heat map. And if, uh, if you're a fan of the weather report like I am, you'll find that this looks a, a little familiar kind of intuitively. It's almost like a Doppler radar thing. And that intuition would serve you well. We have applications categorized uh, across the top. Uh, the, the gray bars represent different levels of categorization. Um, subcategories, et cetera. The actual colored blocks are actual applications in use. Bigger applications represent more usage over the time frame that you're examining. And the redder that application is, the higher the risk factor we have deemed it to have. Um, and for the record, you, it is a, a one to five scale, five being the most dangerous. Uh, you can actually tune the individual application settings yourself if you like. But let's just take a look here and, and try to find something interesting. Um, File sharing is always a great place to do some sleuthing. And uh, I think everybody's familiar with BitTorrent. Let's just check out RapidShare, which we may or may not have heard very much about. So I want to learn a bit, little bit more about RapidShare. I'm just going to come over here into the list, check the value, and all of a sudden I have a quick paragraph or two tutorial about this application. Uh, we can see that this is a one-click file sh sharing service that's free. I can see down here it has a risk factor of four. It has uh, excessive bandwidth uses, uh, usage, transfers files. It's vulnerable, it's prone to misuse, and it's widely used. That's interesting uh, to me. Now, you'll notice that when I click on RapidShare, just the application usage widget is going to update and show me RapidShare usage with, within the last hour. Um, but I might want to just focus the whole application command center on this. So I'm going to hit this little pipe symbol with the left arrow grafted on it. And watch this. It's going to jump over here on the left-hand side and become what we call a global filter. Now, all of a sudden, the entire ACC is going to repaint to this context. And I'm looking at that, that same, those same categories of information in widgets, just focus on rapid share usage. So knowing that this is a pretty risky application, I sure as heck would like to know why we're seeing so much of it. So I'm going to come down here to the rule usage widget, and I'm just going to do a quick global find. This is kind of like a helpish type of pop-up window. And I can see that I have a security rule called Watch Risky Apps. And uh, that, that application, that, uh, that security rule should paint up for me here in a second. There it is. So we can see this is, uh, we're, we're a zone-based firewall, so we can see that uh, the traffic from any zone or any address or any user destined, you guessed it, anywhere is permitted. And um, that might be, hey, note to self, let's go, let's go look at the configuration uh, that, that, that allows that application to be used. Let's just go right back up here again, and let's see who's who might be abusing this application. Well, right off the crack of the bat, we can see we've got uh, Marsha Worth seems to be our most prolific uh, rapid share user. So Marsha, suffice to say, has aroused our curiosity. We're going to let rapid share off the hook for being a global filter. And now I am just looking at Marsha Worth's activity within the last hour. And here's something of note. If we come down here and we look at the source IP activity, we actually have a host name for her laptop. And if I just do a quick global find on that, we'll see that uh, we actually have a pre-configured uh, well, not pre-configured, but we have configured an address object to point to that uh, particular laptop. That's actually pretty cool. I'm going to introduce you to the, another tab here in the ACC. It's called Threat Activity. Now, keeping in mind that we're filtered on Marsha's activity over the last, uh, last hour, we're going to see if she, oh boy, has managed to trip off uh, or, or um, activate any, any threats. And she's been busy. <laughs> so uh, just, just taking a quick look at Marsha's last hour of usage, we can see the, the counts for various threats that she's already set off and, and um, uh, used in the environment. And if we want to learn anything else about them, hey, look at this, wire lurker. This is command and control traffic. Maybe I want to learn more about that. Same applies. I can, I can look at that actual vulnerability. So now that uh, we have a global filter on Marsha, I can actually take this entire view and export it as a PDF. And I can suggest that we either retrain Marsha or perhaps we encourage her to find an alternative career uh, that doesn't involve 
taking down and, and poning her own place of work. So uh, one other thing that I'd like to point out here at the bottom of the threat to activity tab is these two widgets side by side here. This is applications using non-standard ports and rules allowing applications on non-standard ports. These are incredibly insightful. If you remember the door number one, door number two scenario that we explored earlier on, uh, this goes a long way to explaining why that similar uh, you know, three tuple can look completely different at, at different times because we have, we have applications that are running over non-standard, unsuspected ports. When we do eval installations for customers and we come back and we run this report for them, even if the device has been sitting on the network passively for a number of days, we almost always see somebody's mouth drop wide open when they see this report because every, every customer you visit is going, oh, not us. And then they see the report and they go, oh my God. Uh, and, and then furthermore, as you, as you see these applications using non-standard ports, again, this, you know, the same applies. We can, we can run down the rules as well. So that's pretty powerful stuff. And um, we are going to take Marsha off the hook just for a second. And uh, we're going to take a look over here on the monitor tab. So this is kind of like a, a, a logging view of, of what's going on in the firewall. And we're going to look at specifically at a threat log. And we're going to see who's been, who's been triggering threats in the environment. So there's some very cool stuff I want to point out here. You can see anything in here that's text is clickable. And it'll just pop up here. It's like, for instance, um, let me see. I guess it doesn't really matter. You know, if, I, if I click on spyware, uh, the subtype equals spyware. This will filter completely on spyware. Furthermore, there we go. Once we've done that, I can click this little hourglass, and I can look at any threat that was triggered and, and get the full session information for it in one single window. And depending on your policy configuration, you can even crack off PCAPs in line as a matter of policy. How cool is that? Here you are sitting on your firewall, and you just click this down arrow. Yeah, here's a PCAP of when of when so and so uh, you know wire lurked themselves, and uh, then and then there there it is right there in front of you. Um, something else that's kind of cool to check out is we were talking about applications on non-standard ports. If I just go into the traffic log, this is how easy it is to build a query. Um, I'm going to add a filter. I'm just going to say we'll have a pop quiz here. Let's see. Um, destination port equals 53. Does anybody care to guess what we expect to see on port 53? <laughs> yeah, well, DNS would, would, would be uh, the, the, the hopeful answer there. But I'm going to add an AND condition. And I'm going to say the application is not. We have type ahead. So DNS, there it is. We'll add that. And then we'll hit, just hit play. And there it comes. So here's just in the last hour-ish, there's a bunch of application traffic that's BitTorrent that's been transferring files across port 53. So you can get an idea of uh, the kind of visibility that you really have here. So if you think about it, in, a, in a, what really amounts to a short amount of time, we've been able to drill down on a suspicious application, outright finger the user who was using it, the endpoint they were using it from, and clearly identify the threats that they triggered through their questionable activity. And that was with me running my mouth. Um, this is, this, again, this is incredibly powerful. And it's not, it's not at all hard. I really, really want to drive that point home. Um, you know, in terms of uh, for, the, for the security practitioners in the house, this is the, the policy set for security. It's just, it's a firewall. It's, it's top-down processing, left to right, first match wins. When we create a policy, we can choose uh, source zones source IP addresses. Uh, we can use any of these kinds of things as match criteria. We can have the user as match criteria or their group. And in terms of destinations, again, IP addresses, geolocation information, um, zones, etc. Applications. Applications can even be grouped manually by you, or they can be used as filters that share common behavioral characteristics. Um, we can use this uh, service URL category that's uh, pretty much the, the, the port assignment. We can actually enforce or deny uh, default ports for uh, applications. And then 
last but not least, you know, how are we going to handle this traffic? Remember, it's a de deny by default policy, so we get out the scalpel and we safely enable only what we want to enable. And um, something else that I want to show you here is uh, the, these things are called profile settings. You see all of these categories here, antivirus, vulnerability protection, that's IPS, IDS, anti-spyware, URL filtering, file blocking, data filtering, wildfire uh, submissions for, for unknown threats. All of these represent individual profiles, each individual type of which you can create multiples, many of them, and you can deploy these as granularly and as flexibly as you would like to accomplish your mission. And uh, you may find that for, for your purposes in your deployment that uh, a lean mean rule set that's very aggressive on blocking stuff is great, but maybe you have a policy that uh, you know, no new antivirus uh, definitions can be put in play until they've been evaluated for a day. Or maybe you have a soak site that you actually want to let vulnerabilities play out on or a honeypot. So, I, I, what I'm really, really hoping that, that we've been able to do is uh, kind of expand our thinking about what it, what it is we're up against, how we got there, and how Palo Alto Networks can help you meet, your, meet the modern adversary at their level and, and beat them at their own game. Um, really, really, truly thank you for your time today. If you have any follow-up questions, I'll be available after the session. We can, we can uh, maybe uh, find Jim and talk about some of the SCCA stuff. Or if you have any Palo Alto-specific questions, we are over at booth 328. Do I have any of my Palo Alto folks in the room? Do I have that number right? I believe it's 328. But uh, we, we would love to have you come by and chit-chat. And uh, I'll give you back three and a half minutes in your day. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.